performing his original songs along with blues, rock, and country standards throughout his life. And his music is influenced by intriguing characters and stories from history, the roots of the music he loves, and the diversity of the human experience. Waterman, John has an MA in popular music history from Prescott College in addition to an MA in psychology, and we are excited to have him here. Please enjoy. about the coughing, folks. It's a, uh, it's a genetic condition, and it's way worse when it's humid outside. So. But don't worry, I'm not contagious. Put it away. DNA cannot be passed from uh, to the air. <laughs> Apologies about that, too. Thank you for coming out today, and thank you to Wheel and Library for hosting this program. My name is John Waterman. <clears throat> in this show, we're going to explore and celebrate the roots of popular music in America through songs. So these are songs about music or musicians, or songs that have a backstory that helps to illustrate the story of popular music in this country. And that story is constantly changing because we're constantly having new experiences and gaining new perspectives and creating new music from those experiences and those perspectives. So the story of our music is a living story. It's not fixed to traditional styles or historic instruments or old songs that have been performed the same way countless times. There is room for new interpretations of those old songs and new instruments playing those old songs, as well as new songs, maybe songs that we've written to celebrate our history. Of course, this is not a new instrument. This is actually a very old instrument, but not as old as some of the songs. Throughout history, music was a social experience. Musicians made their living by performing at social gatherings. That started to change in 1877 when Edison invented the phonograph. The first commercial recordings came out in wax cylinders. Eventually, those were replaced with shellac discs. And those were eventually replaced with vinyl discs. But the idea of recording onto wax stuck as the phonograph became more and more a household item, as records became more and more popular. Then as radio was introduced and radio stations started to play music, the experience of music became less dependent on social gatherings and increasingly an experience that could be had at home, sometimes by oneself. Musicians had to adapt to this in order to fly their trade and even in order to survive. They had to find a way to have their music pressed into wax. <clears throat> Where life's stories were told As the church houses 
rocked and built big wheels rolled and no purpose the work got around very rare studio was looking for the sound yeah from the common thread of how life was led by the blacks and the whites and then somebody said Mr. Phillips there's a song you got here get a song with a crown came from the first and it broke and done that this is the list what you press in your wax and from the fields came a cry from the pulpit show from the fields came the blue song by those down and out from the deep joints and jazz clubs and slums and all from where the top goes tall Mr. Henry, here's a song you've got here. That's a part of the deep playing through the years. It is sung by someone who might slip through the cracks. Mr. Henry, won't you press in your wax? five individuals not primarily known for being musicians who played a big part in shaping the story of American popular music. Ralph Pierce, Sam Phillips, John Hammond, and John and Ellen Lohans. A lot of folks that I've talked to have never heard of Ralph Pierre. Anyone? Some, some of that. Yeah. Ralph Pierre was a talent scout for Victor Records in the 1920s. In 1927, he took his recording equipment south from New York. He was looking for musicians from the Southern Appalachians. Pierre had this idea that people living in rural areas would be more inclined to buy records from artists who would come from a background similar to their own, who had a lifestyle they could relate to. And it turned out that he was right. In two weeks of recording sessions in the town of Bristol, on the border of Virginia and Tennessee, he discovered both the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers, two of the earliest superstars of American popular music. The other four individuals mentioned in the song, most people have heard of. Sam Phillips, the founder of Sun Records, he discovered Howlin' Wolf, Elvis, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, and other folks. John Hammond, the talent scout and producer, he discovered Count Basie, Billie Holiday, Bob Dylan, Aretha Franklin, and a whole lot of other people. And John and Ellen Lomax, father and son folklorists, they conducted field recordings throughout the South and documented songs in the American oral tradition. Their work gave rise to the commercial genre of folk music that would emerge in the 1940s and 50s. In 1934, the Lomaxes were conducting a field recording at Sugarland Prison in Texas. They recorded a prisoner named Ironhead Baker singing a song called St. James Hospital. That song is part of what's known as the Rape Cycle. That's a series of songs that are thought to have evolved out of an 18th century English ballad called The Unfortunate Rape. That song was brought to this country by settlers and immigrants, and over time it evolved. In Nova Scotia, it appeared as a ballad called The Bad Girl's Lament. 
And in the American West, it appears as the cowboy song, Streets of Laredo. What all of the songs of the rape cycle have in common is they're all a series of requests from a dying character as to what he or she wants at his or her, fu his or her funeral. Requests like beat the drums slowly, play the fife lowly, or have six jolly cowboys carry the coffin. In the jazz and blues song, this song appears as St. James Infirmary Blues. <clears throat> I need to buy one of those sticks from the microphone stand that has the water holder on it. I went down to St. James in Furway just to see my baby there. She was lying on a long white table, so pale, so cold, and so fair. Oh, let it go, oh, let it go, God bless her. Wherever she may be, she may search this whole wide world all over. Oh, but she's never gonna find another man. Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. 
God bless me. I'll go wherever, oh, wherever she may be. But she makes the whole wide world all over. Oh, but she's never gonna find another. Fortunate rape might have found its way into the blues through the cowboy belt streets of Laredo. You wouldn't know it from the history books and you wouldn't know it from the Hollywood westerns. But it turns out there were a lot of black cowboys. It's estimated that about one in four cowboys was of African descent. And it would make sense that those cowboys would have taken to singing songs about cowboys that they heard sung by other cowboys. But they would have sung those cowboy songs according to their own musical sensibilities rooted in the pentatonic scale used in African music. The pentatonic scale has fewer notes in it than the Western scale, which means there's more space between some of the notes, space that can be used for an expressive sliding around on the pitch or bending the notes. Over time, depending on where the emphasis is placed in those spaces and on where it's heard in those spaces, a song that's in a major key, like Streets of Laredo, could start to be heard as being in a minor key, like St. James Infirmary Blues. If in fact that's what happened with St. James Infirmary, we'd expect there to be a song with lyrics similar to Streets of Laredo, but in a minor key. It turns out that St. James Hospital, sung by Byron Head Baker, and recorded by the Lomaxes in 1934 is such a song. And that song might be the missing link that allowed an 18th century English ballad to be reborn as a blues. New Orleans and jazz is well known. In the late 1800s, the forerunners of the blues, the field hollers and spirituals and African songs the Mississippi Delta region came down the Mississippi River along with the ragtime music that was popular in the day. 
and in New Orleans, those styles combined with the French music of the native Creole population, the Latin rhythms of nearby Cuba, and the Italian music of the more recent Sicilian immigrants, and that formed jazz. The origin of the blues is a bit more muddy. The term blue was used to mean a state of sadness or depression long before it was used to describe a style of music. And there were songs with varying degrees of similarity to what we now call blues before there was a musical style known as blues. The first song to be written and published with blues in the title that also has a musical pattern that's associated with the blues was a song called I Got the Blues written and published in 1909 by New Orleans musician Anthony Maggio. That song's not a blues. It's a, it's a ragtime piece. And only one section of the song, one movement only, has, has that musical pattern that's associated with the blues. Maggio claimed to have gotten the title and the melody from an elderly black guitar player that he heard. And that unknown guitar player, player that unknown guitar player might have been playing his own interpretation of an earlier song called I've Got D Blues, written and published in 1901 by Chris Smith and Elmer Bowen. That song is also a ragtime number, but that song doesn't have that musical pattern that's associated with the blues. The singer Ma Rain and the composer W.C. Handy both recall first hearing blues sometime around 1902. And Jelly Roll Morton is known to have composed New Orleans blues and Jelly Roll blues sometime between 1904 and 1910. Now, he didn't publish those songs until years later, but knowing the approximate years he wrote them gives us a pretty good idea that the blues first appeared as a style we know it as sometime during those years, sometime between 1902 and 1910. There's a historic site in the Mississippi Delta region called Dockery Farm, or Dockery Plantation. It was a sharecropping plantation where cotton was grown. It was established in the years after the Civil War. The reason it's a historic site is because of some of the people who lived there. Charlie Patton, Willie Brown, Son House, Tommy Johnson, Robert Johnson, Howlin' Wolf, Pop Staples, Honey Boy Edwards, all well-known bluesmen. Heard of them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These bluesmen all lived on Dockery or near Dockery around the same time. These legends all there at the same time. And they would have jam sessions going late into the night to entertain the other tenants. Because of that, Dockery is considered one of the birthplaces of the blues. Now, according to legend, Charlie Patton learned to play the guitar from a mysterious figure named Henry Sloan. We don't, we hardly know anything at all about Henry Sloan. Um, no details at all. We assume he was probably a real person. Um, some historians think they might have identified his death certificate. <coughs> That's all we know. Other legends hold that Tommy Johnson and Robert Johnson both sold their souls to the devil to learn how to play the guitar. So we'll check those out someday when we talk to the devil. We'll find out. In the meantime, we'll get to listen to this song called Dockery Farm, which has a bunch of uh, bad plays on the words. And you'll hear the names of uh, those various bluesmen who drew out the song in one form or another. Talk 
a plantation harvesting. Down on down on a plantation, you know the work don't ever stop. Cause it takes a lot of pain to raise that far a bit of crop. And they're hurt and don't have a season. So please go all year round. Now, when you have got a daughter at home, you can talk and never slow. You've got nothing left to lose, they'll tell you where to get a loan. And if you get out of bed, you're out of heart with your soul. Well, when you're dealing with the devil boy, Cause I'm talking about plantation, you can't go anywhere but down. Cause you walk the fields tilled by Charlie Brown, the Willie Brown, the Smith Lane Nuts and Golden Bottle. Those are the tools you have to use. To slide beneath the gravel. See, just like anything that grows in blue skies, that is a seed. Could be loneliness or jealousy, prejudice or greed, a cheap lover and a lonely bull. On that side, Captain Hope. Those are the staples that we need to get the blue sky to grow. Johnson and Johnson Lay on down in Mississippi, down on Dodger Farm. Where people come and they're down out of the woods, down in front. I've been waiting for my woman. I'm still waiting for some news. On Dodger Plantation, Charlie Patton is considered the father of the Delta Blues. Not much is known about his childhood or his upbringing. Historians agree that he probably had Native American ancestry. He was probably part Choctaw or some argue, some argue part Cherokee. And it's been suggested that his rhythms and his vocal stylings might have been influenced by Native American music that he heard as a child. So there's actually a good case to be made that. Native American music is, as well, a component of the blues. Big story, the, a big part of the story of American popular music is the story of immigrants. In the early 1800s, a large number of German, Czech, and Polish immigrants settled in Texas, which was then part of Mexico. 
They brought with them their music and dances and instruments. And over time, the native Tejano population incorporated those polkas and waltzes and the accordion into their traditional rancheros. And that gave rise to a style known as Norteño in northern Mexico. And it gave rise to conjunto and Tejano music in this country. Lydia Mendoza was one of the pioneers of Tejano music. She's, she was one of the first popular Spanish language recording artists in this country. Narciso Martinez was an accordion player. He's considered the father of conjunto music. He developed a new approach to his instrument that, that emphasized the melody notes played on his right hand, while his partner in the duo, Santiago Almeida, would hold down the bass and rhythm lines on a double string baritone guitar called a babo sexto. Enrique Valentin was the owner of a furniture store in Brownsville, Texas. In the early 1930s, a number of record labels started pursuing the same marketing strategy in rural Texas that Victor Records had in the Appalachians in the 1920s. They operated on a premise that people living in the rural area would be more interested in buying records from artists from that area. Enrique Valentin had a lot of contacts who were musicians. And he was able to serve as a talent broker to the agents from these various record companies when they came to Texas looking for Tejano or Conjunto musicians. <laughs> Almost caught my breath now from the coughing right there. <laughs> So, there are chapters in history that are unpleasant to talk about, but we can't ignore them. They're part of the story, part of the reason things are the way they are. If we ignore those chapters, we fail to recognize how they shaped our attitudes and our culture. If we ignore those chapters, we fail as a culture to recognize past wrongs. By acknowledging shameful chapters in our history, we can atone for past injustices and 
start to heal the divisions they brought about and hopefully start to come together as a people. Back around 1830, an actor by the name of Thomas Rice put burnt cork on his face and created a character based on a song and dance he saw being done by a handicapped handicap black stable hand. That was the beginning of blackface minstrelsy. The character he created was Jim Crow. The character would perform a song called Jump Jim Crow that consisted of multiple verses sung in a mocking black dialect and set to an old English melody. In addition to being a cruel mockery, the song was also an expression of anti-elitism, and it became popular with the supporters of Andrew Jackson. Thomas Rice went on to become a wealthy and famous man and inspire hundreds of imitators. Minstrelsy went on to become a form of hateful propaganda, even more so as the debate over slavery intensified, and even more than that, in the aftermath of the Civil War. When art and music are used to spread hatred, the hatred can become ingrained in the culture, can become a part of the culture. As years pass and generations pass, and as hopefully the hatred comes to be seen for being the evil that it is, any art or music that was used to spread that hatred can no longer be appreciated as art or entertainment. It becomes nothing more than a grotesque relic that's only fit to be kept in a museum. And that's what happened with a lot of the songs from minstrelsy. The minstrel shows were a vehicle through which a representation of black music and black people was introduced to a large number of non-black Americans who had had little or no contact with black Americans. And even as the shows became increasingly insulting and degrading towards African Americans and other minorities, the performers in those shows would compete with one another for what they imagined was authenticity in their representation of black music. So what they were insulting and degrading, they were at the same time idealizing. Sounding black, or what they thought was sounding black, became their ideal. But the, um, the qualities that they idealized in the music, they attributed to the irrelevant characteristic of skin color rather than to the hard work, passion, and devotion of individual black artists, or the openness at that time of black culture generally. And that's a big part of what racism and prejudice is right there, is um, the taking away of credit or blame from individuals, and reassigning that credit or blame to a whole population based on irrelevant criteria like the color of somebody's skin or their ethnic origin. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's still part of our world. I got a few guitars, it's still part of our world. This is called Thomas Rice. Yeah, there's 
speeches by grand eloquent ones. And banjos after they their old plantations. Jim Dandy would be there, and the Lucy Long with Thomas Rice and his traveling. songs in the Mississippi Delta region. But there's an alternate theory that suggests that the blues instead evolved out of black vaudeville, as it was performed on a circuit of theaters in the late 1890s and early 1900s. Butler May was a performer on that circuit, even though he's barely remembered today. In his time, he was immensely popular. Anybody heard of him? No. When Butler May would come to town when he was playing in a theater, the theaters would be packed lines to get in, stretching out into the streets and down the street. Here's Butler May. We don't have any photos of him. They're pretty old and gray. Butler May was a child prodigy. From an early age, he was sharing the bill with artists like Ma and Pa Rainey and Jolly Roll Morton. And it turned out that he was a natural comedian as well. Soon he was headlining his own shows under the name String Beans because he was tall and thin. By the autumn of 1914, Butler May had taken his act up north. He was performing at the Monogram Theater in Chicago, one of the most prestigious venues on the Black Vaudeville circuit. His signature number was a performance piece about the Titanic. In the piece, he would stand at the piano and sway back and forth to depict the ship rocking on the water. Then he'd slowly sink at the piano to show the ship sinking. And all the while, he'd be singing about how he was on the Titanic but he was able to swim to safety because he had Elgin movements in his hips with a 20-year guarantee. Elgin was a watch brand. The movements are the mechanical parts of a watch. Elgin watches were advertised coming with a 20-year guarantee on the movements. That innuendo that Butler may use after his lifetime, it turns up again and again in the blues from before Robert Johnson all the way up to Buddy Guy. And it's known as the Elgin Movement's metaphor. When Butler May brought his act up north, the northern audiences had never seen anything like him before. He was spontaneous, he improvised much of his act, and he was vulgar. The black press criticized him for being too blue. Blue being a vaudeville term for being vulgar on stage, probably related to the blue laws. And it may or may not be coincidental that there are some who consider Butler May to have been the original blues man. <laughs> Montgomery, Alabama, on a hot summer day, just before the sun went down. A kid was playing piano on the back of a train, and a crowd of people gathered around. So old at the beginning of a storm that you left on cold. If you listen to some say you might still be what you play today. The name was Butler May, soon he was touring the south, playing a black vaudeville stage. He was tall and lean and a cold string beans, and his act was all the rage. Wherever we played, we draw crowd because the songs he wrote.
I go to Harlem? Street beans while the house is down. He sang the Titanic in a piano log and he sang Alabama Bound. But when he took the stage, people all agreed he had the kind of movements that were guaranteed. So the critics wrote it down and took the ball and it was From Jacksonville, Florida, one in November day, they were the ball and they was gone. He was being pledged to a fraternal lodge when an amazing ritual went wrong. He was just 23, much too young, at the beginning of a song that he left unsung. But if you listen some say, you might still be one of the today. Down in Georgia and Florida, he played on the bill with the Rainies and Joe Moore. But up north in Chicago, a mob would gather on State Street and the string beans did the score. Some say Butler may may have invented the blues, but nobody can do the same. Cause he never recorded or published his songs, and no one ever heard him play. They said he was the funniest man of love, but he's hardly more than a kid. Some say Butler may may have invented the blues, but no Father of Blues. A style appeared that some music writers are now calling proto blues. These were ragtime tin pan alley tunes that had evolved out of certain African American folk songs like Frankie and John and Staff Lee. Only a small number of these proto blues songs have been identified. The most prolific composer of them was a fellow named Huey Cannon. Huey Cannon was a tin pan alley songwriter. He's best remembered for writing the jazz standard, Bill Bailey Won't You Please Come Home. He also wrote a Tin Pan Alley adaptation of Frankie and Johnny that became popular. Hugh Cannon started out playing piano in the saloons of Jackson, Michigan, and he spent his life traveling between the Detroit area and New York, where he was a writer on Tin Pan Alley. He also probably started out drinking in uh, the saloons of Jackson, Michigan, because he was an alcoholic from an early age. That led to an early death at the age of 35 in Toledo, Ohio, around 1910 or so. Oh, should I plug this in? Yeah. Maybe it'll behave.
Jackson to Manhattan. You can leave your name. Break the music for the publishers to sell. Some songs you go to the parties, and some songs you go to shows. And to make this band block, you can't go to sell. Cause you eat candy, have been drinking hard. Fun as time you was a kid. There's a man this drinking, he walk away his wife. Oh, he drank away the salt and rope in the bed. There will be no morning men that don't hurt wrong. There's a little bad part of the feeling he had to pay it. Now I'm paying in strong notes that do not have to count. And it's been five years since Detroit took a show. Going by the square pillars in the heat. And there's a lot of men who fall and go beside the ways that we have. century, by the start of the 20th century, the phonograph became a household item. And throughout the 1900s, records were a popular source of home entertainment. And eventually they gave way to 8-track tapes, and those gave way to cassettes, and those gave way to CDs, and then digital downloads, and now we're coming back around to vinyl records again. <laughs> but throughout that time, there have been those for whom the record is more than just a source of entertainment. There are the, uh, the record collectors, you know, these, uh, these dreaded scoundrels who um, frequent <laughs> pawn shops and thrift stores, flea markets and yard sales. I've seen some of these folks in action. And um, they're looking for uh, that rare find, that rare collectible that's going to make them able to retire early and buy a mansion on an island somewhere. For one of these record collectors, a prize find would be an Elvis Sun Session 45. Or a Beatles Yesterday and Today with the Book Your Block cover. Or a 78 <coughs> of, of Me and the Devil by Robert Johnson. Those, uh, all those fetch a good penny at an auction. Probably not quite enough to buy an island. So, um, the Elvis Sun Session 45s, these were the singles released by Elvis on the Sun Records before he was signed to RCA in 1955. Sun Records, as we mentioned earlier, was founded by Sam Phillips. Sam Phillips got his start at a, working at a radio station in Alabama, which, unusual for the time and place, played both black and white artists back to back. That influenced his approach to music and to business. And um, he was primarily interested in recording blues acts, but at Sun Records he wound up recording all styles of music. And as we know, he discovered, he was the first to record Hollow Wolf, he discovered Elvis and Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, and all those guys. <clears throat> Being a record collector, I would imagine, is not without risks. I'm sure a lot of these folks have like, thinned their wallets and lost their life savings and maybe even uh, their houses and spouses. And then it wound up with a garage full of dusty old records and nothing more. But this song is actually about a circumstance that has a happy career. She 
said what you spent all the money for And it's dusty old records from the second hand So I said that's alright mom, don't criticize I come home with a real good prize But I'm home with the daddy kind Listen to Sunset 45 This is worth me 15 grand To put the best dress on, take my hand Turn up the volume, turn down the light It's hard to keep on rocking the night Buzz like this at night This is the sunset for five The sunset for five The sunset for five The holy smoke and the sea so light This is the sunset for five And well, me and the devil went for a spin our number came up, now we'll be cashing in. Remember Cousin Carol, used to reel and rock. She was looking for the Beatles on what you block. My ship's coming, it's finally arrived. When you see the Beatles at 10 years ago at a show, a woman requested that I play the song Stardust, the old standard by Hobie Carmichael. After the show, she told me a story. She said back during the war, this would have been World War II, she and her brother would go out dancing to the big bands. The last song of the night, the band would play Stardust, and her brother would always save that dance for her. <coughs> then he was off to war to fight on the Italian front, and he never came back. And to that day, she always requested Stardust in his memory. <clears throat> you okay? Yeah. I didn't even get my 
DNA. <laughs> I didn't think I was possible. The band was playing Stardust. read the letter that he sent as he marched towards Rome. She read the letter saying he was never coming home. She prayed that there was some mistake, that somehow he was spared, but it was a last Popular music tells our stories and marks the events in our lives, not just the uh, global and historic events like World War II, but our everyday experiences. And by sharing those stories and experiences, individuals come to identify as a people, as a culture, whether it's from sharing the stories of their heroes, or retelling the stories their heroes told, or from collectively atoning for past injustices. So the voices of storytellers, of artists and musicians, play an important part in shaping our identity as a people. And in a country as divided as ours is, we need those voices to remind us that there is an American culture. It's in the stories and experiences that we share. 
but there's a tendency to try to control or stifle those voices. There are politicians and religious leaders who want to determine what goes into the stories and who hears them. There are business leaders who want to keep the arts subordinate and subservient to business interests. And there are independent entrepreneurs, aspiring kingmakers, who want to further their own ambitions and further the careers of friends or family members by keeping other voices from being heard. Blind Alfred Reed was a street performer from West Virginia in the early 1900s. He was a fiddle player, a singer, a songwriter, and a preacher. He became popular around his hometown of Princeton, West Virginia. And in 1927, he was invited by Ralph Peer to participate in what would turn out to be the historic Bristol Sessions, where Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family would be discovered. Alfred Reed traveled to Bristol, and he recorded some sides, and they were well received. And he went on to record several more times over the next few years. And he had attained a certain level of regional success. Some of his songs are still sung today. But then the Depression hit, and the record companies no longer had the capital to invest in developing rural acts. And Alfred Reed returned to being a street performer in his hometown of Princeton, West Virginia. Until 1937, when the town passed a new ordinance prohibiting street music. Some years later, Alfred Reed died. Now, according to some sources, the cause of his death was starvation. Now, a number of years have passed, enough time that we can't necessarily say that he, was, he starved to death because the town prohibited street music. <clears throat> but, by denying him his livelihood and his passion, weren't they metaphorically starving him anyway? And weren't they starving the rest of us and people around him from hearing his unique voice? <coughs> I'm going to leave you with this last song. This is called Blind Off of Reed. I truly hope you've enjoyed the program. I want to thank you again for coming out. And, uh, putting up with my coughing and so on. Down on the corner in West Virginia town, a man who got a fiddle. The people gathered around, the fresh air had been. But the times was the tough job of hard to find.